Well, good morning, Oakwood. Oh, man, I was a little hopeful for second service, but you gotta understand, my name is Mark Phillips. I'm the student minister here at Oakwood, and uh, I'm, I'm used to a little bit more excitement with our students, so let me just try this one more time. It's early, it's Sunday morning, I get it, so let's just try it one more time together. Good morning. Good morning. Oh, man, music to my ears. That's awesome. That's great. Uh, yeah, if you were expecting Eric uh, this morning, I'm so sorry to disappoint you. Uh, but man, the great news is that we both uh, pull from the same gospel, and, and hopefully today the Word of God will, will cover us and saturate our lives. So if you would, before we uh, run this race together this morning, let's, let's pray together. Uh, Holy Father, we are so grateful that uh, you are God in heaven, that there is no other name in the entire universe greater than yours. God, that you are the star breather. There is nothing in existence that wasn't made without you. And Father, you are here today, and you love us. You are so good. Open our eyes, open our ears, and our hearts. And God, even this morning, lives would be changed to turn towards you. We love you, and most of all, we thank you for Jesus. It's in his name that we pray. Amen. Let's go back a little bit together. Uh, If you were here last year when I got to preach uh, at our graduate recognition service, uh, you'll remember that I I hate running. I hate it. I I despise it. I get tired watching people run. Uh, It's it's awful. Um, People are always like, let's go running. And I'm like, why do you hate me? Um, It's that's horrible, terrible. so ironically, today, my entire message is about running. Um, so that's going to be fun, but I'm really excited. Um, if you'll remember back in 2008, the Beijing uh, Summer Olympics, there were, there were a few stories that were really quite incredible, pretty crazy from the Olympics in 2008. One of them was the story of Michael Phelps. If you remember Michael Phelps in swimming, he completely dominated by winning eight gold medals in the Olympics. Just unprecedented. I mean, it was amazing, incredible to watch. Uh, If you remember, there was uh, that four by 200 relay where one of his teammates came from behind to win, uh, ensuring that he would get another gold medal. And there was also that that race with the one one hundredth of a second win in the 100 butterfly. I mean, just incredible to watch. Everyone on on edge there was another story that was pretty incredible usain bolt ran away literally with uh the the track and field headlines shattering the 100 and 200 meter world records at the olympics it was crazy watching him it was like he was just jogging to win i mean he is facing olympic athletes the best in the world and that's not a doctored photo at all i mean he he was so far ahead he could just trot over the finish line. It was incredible to watch. Now, there was a third pretty crazy story that you may not remember from the 2008 Olympics. It was the men's and the women's relay, 4x100 relay. The U.S. had dominated this event through the years, and both teams were actually favored to bring home the gold medal. But the first time in the modern Olympics... Both teams, both men and women, didn't even make it to the finals. And here's the reason. They dropped the baton on their exchange during the preliminary heats. Dropped the baton. So today I want to talk to you about a good baton pass. A good baton pass. Today is a day that we honor a couple seniors. Uh, It's always a, a fun service and we get to celebrate with them this milestone in their life. And graduation typically marks a transitional moment, right? It's it's in a lot of ways the end of one leg and the start of another. It also marks a significant moment of empowerment, you know, reaching the age of 18, moving away from home. It's this transition into adulthood in our culture today. In the months that follow graduation, the, the move to college or the workforce is a transitional moment marked by independence. And to put it another way, it's like we're in a season of passing the baton and telling them, hey, go for it. Go for it. And this is a lot like what's happening in 2 Timothy with Paul and Timothy. And so 
Um, I'm a little old school, so there's going to be a lot of things on the screen today. But you're welcome to turn in your Bible to 2 Timothy chapter 2, or if you uh, want to hop on the Bible app, you can do a live event there and take notes. Um, and I'm also just going to put the whole scripture up on the screen uh, just to make it incredibly easy for you. No excuse. You have the Bible, right? Um, so here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to read it out loud, and I want you to follow along uh, in your Bible or on the app or on the screen here. So 2 Timothy chapter 2. Uh, if you have trouble finding 2 Timothy, it's right after 1 Timothy. Um, there's also this great thing that I use all the time, even today at the beginning, called the Table of Contents. It tells you exactly what page to turn to. It's amazing. Great invention. Uh, 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 1 and 2. You then, my child, be strengthened by the grace that is in Christ Jesus. And what you have heard from me in the presence of many witnesses, entrust to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. Do you see the race language that's happening here? If not, it's okay, because I've got a whole sermon prepared to show you. It's amazing. Paul and Timothy, it's this incredible image here of a race, and it's like this. The first leg is Paul. The first leg is Paul, and the second leg is Timothy, right? So Paul says, hey, what you have heard from me. He's telling Timothy, what you've heard from me in the presence of many witnesses. That first leg, Paul's running, and then along comes Timothy, and he says, you've heard me say these things. In the presence of many witnesses. So leg one, Paul. Leg two, Timothy. The third leg is trustworthy people. In the presence of many witnesses, entrust to faithful men. I'm running this race and I'm handing it off to you. And you've heard me do this to trustworthy people. And then the fourth leg, others. You've heard me in the presence of many witnesses to entrust to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. It's this idea that it just keeps going. It never stops. And I love the picture that's created here. It's actually kind of at the core of our student ministry here at Oakwood. We want to come alongside parents, and we want to help move students uh, out of a religion into a relationship with Jesus. And hopefully, the goal is for that relationship to go beyond the walls of this building, that they would carry this truth in their lives and live it out every day. We want to see them carry this relationship. And we call it spiritual reproduction or discipleship. It's this idea that that a student uh, comes to a relationship with Jesus and then they live that out in their life. They hear it and they live it and then they pass it on to someone else. And then that person hears it and they live it. And they pass it on to someone else. And it just keeps going and going and going. And we know it works because this race started 2,000 years ago the first century church. And guess what? You're all here today. It works. For me, um, though, the trick is that I've seen too many bad handoffs. I've been doing student ministry for a while now, and I've seen a lot of bad handoffs. You got a student who's primed, ready to, to, to accept the call in their life, and, and it makes sense, and it clicks. But for some reason, the handoff fails. For me, it it has a lot to do with transition from youth group or student ministry into graduation, into life, whether that be college or the workforce. But, But the idea goes well beyond seniors. It's for grandparents and parents It's for small group leaders and and children's ministry volunteers. It's for bosses and it's for teachers. In fact, it's actually for everyone who takes seriously the call of Jesus Christ on their life. So, guess what? This sermon isn't just for the seniors. It's not just for the graduates. It's for all of us today. So how do we make sure that this Timothy 2.2 works correctly? Now, this may sound weird, especially since I hate running so much. But I think that we can pull some great lessons on a good spiritual handoff from the rules that govern track and field relay races. Here are three actual rules from the United States track and field relay rule book and what we can learn from them to create a 2 Timothy 2-2 style handoff. Rule number 25. The baton shall be a smooth, hollow circular tube made of wood metal or other rigid material in one piece its length shall be about 
or between 28 and 30 centimeters. Its circumference shall be 12 to 13 centimeters, and it shall weigh not less than 50 grams. No material or substance may be applied to the baton. Where am I going with this, right? That's what you're thinking. Like, what, what, what's happening here? Here it is. Thought number one. Ready? It has to be the right baton. And what's our baton? What is it? What is the thing that we're trying to pass off? The gospel. The gospel. Good news. When it comes to investing in others, we can get focused on a lot of things that may be good things, but they're not the right things. You know, with students, I see it all the time. They, they get so focused on, on good behavior. If I just, if I act good, if I'm a good kid, then everything's going to be all right. I'm fulfilling what I need to fulfill. Uh, they focus on good behavior, strong grades, athletic success, scholarships. Well, those are all good things. There's nothing wrong with those things. But if that becomes the focus of your life, if everything about you is focused on, well, well how am I going to get into college? Where am I going to go to college? What am I going to do with my life? Who am I? If that's what you're focused on, it's so self-centered and self-centric. You're not focused on the kingdom. You're not focused on God. You can focus on good things, but sometimes it's not the right thing. And sometimes you can get so focused on the good things that you completely miss the God thing. If you tweet or Facebook, I, I give you permission to use that. We can get so focused on the good things that we completely miss the God things. And it happens all the time. Here's rule number two from, from the rule book. Each takeover zone shall be 20 meters long, of which the scratch line is the center. The zones shall start and finish at the edges of the zone lines, nearest the start line in the running direction. In case you're confused by what this rule is saying, there are lines that are marked as the takeover zone. I've got a little illustration to show you here. Um, you can kind of see the green uh, area there in the middle of the track. There, there's a certain zone that the handoff has to happen in. If it doesn't take place in that zone, then you fail, right? The race is over. Parents, can I talk to you just for a second about time management and priorities? Just for one second. This is just for parents, which is most of us, right? As I interact with parents during this time of year, I hear this phrase all the time. All the time. They grow up so fast. They grow up so fast. A little baby. They grow up so fast. Right? All the time I hear it so often. And it's true. It's true. Uh, my wife and I have a, a little son, Brian. He's a little over a year now. And uh, just within the last couple of days, he's like, I'm a big boy now. And he's like walking and it's cool. Um, and, and, you know, they do. They grow up fast. You know, sometimes we're sitting at home um, to the, the melodic tune of our son screaming like a pterodactyl. And, um, we remember what it was like when he would just lay on the floor and, like, not do anything. It was amazing. We, like, I love that he's walking around and cool now, but it's like, can we just go back? <laughs> just one, one. But, but it's awesome, and, and it's true. It, it's just part of life. They grow up really fast. But parents, there's a date, there's a time that's coming where your kids aren't going to be at home anymore. They're going to move on. They're going to graduate. They're going to get a job. They're going to go to college. They're going to move out. And some of you are like, you know, holding the reins tight, like, never leave me. Uh, and some of you are like, bye. <laughs> Love you. Come back sometime. You know? Um, and I get that. But I think for all of us, there's a point where we say, man, I miss, I miss those times. Where did the time go? But I want to challenge you a little bit. Make the most of the time that you have right now. Because here's, here's another truth. The most valuable thing that you can give your kid in this present time is your presence. The most valuable thing that you can give your kid before they leave, before they go off, 
is your presence. And I'm not talking about, you know, the card with the, the money in it, not those kinds of presents. No, your presence, your time with them. Because here's another reality, and you may be familiar with this from your own life. You go off and you, you leave mom and dad, and you, you don't really remember the cards that you opened up, and you, and you don't really remember the gifts. But what you do me- remember are the moments, the time that you spent with the people that you're no longer with. Um, my, my mom is here today, which is kind of cool. She, she hates when I do this. I love it. Um, she, she's here today. And, uh, and we, we only live, you know, two hours apart. And, and um, you know, it, it's, it's great when we get to spend time together. You know, my dad's a minister over in Jinx, and I, I'm in ministry. So it's, it, weekends are really hard for us to kind of get away or do anything. Um, and so when we find time to get together and, and, and have moments, it's awesome. And we cherish it. Um, but I'm telling you, take the moments you have now. Invest now. Now, now I don't want you to be confused. I'm not, I'm not trying to say that uh, the window for your kids or for really anyone in our life, for that matter, uh, to respond to Jesus has an age limit or a time limit. That's not what I'm saying, right? Because never forget that the thief on the cross next to Jesus found paradise with his dying breath. So so I'm not saying that if you don't convey the message of hope and and truth to your kids before they leave, like it's never going to happen. No, our God's bigger than that. But what I am saying is that you have the most opportunity, the most time, and the most uh, influence that you can have right now. I mean, think about it. They're still in your house. They're still coming home every night, most, most every night. There is no other time that you'll have in your relationship with your kids than right now. So invest. Invest. Make the most of every opportunity. Right? So here's rule number 12 from the rule book. The baton shall be carried by hand throughout the race. You know, and I was reading this and researching this. I thought that was really weird. I'm like, where else are they going to hold it? You know? They're running with this baton like they don't have pockets in those little things. I don't know. It was, just, it was funny to me. Uh, so the, the baton has to be carried by hand throughout the race. If dropped, it will be recovered by the athlete who dropped it. He or she may leave the assigned lane to retrieve the baton, provided no other runner is impeded, and provided that by doing so, the distance to be covered is not lessened. And here's the third thought from this. A dropped baton is not the end of the race. Like I said, I didn't grow up running. This was never part of my life. So I always thought that if you drop the baton, like, race over, right? Pack your bags, go home. Now, in the exchange lane that's got to take place, that's, that's something different. We're talking about if you're just running and you drop the baton, your race isn't over. As long as the one who dropped it is the one who picks it up, and as long as you don't obstruct the other runners, and, and as long as you don't create a shortcut for yourself, you can pick it back up and keep racing. That's some pretty good news. So what does this have to do with spiritual transitions? I'm glad you asked. There's a lot of research out there today that, that says when a high school kid graduates, it's like they're graduating from their faith. Uh, we see alarming statistics of, of, of students who graduate out of high school and, and church is just no longer a part of their life. But there's actually some new research that's come out uh, you know, recently that it is showing that it's not, they're not waiting until they graduate high school. Like while they're in high school and even into middle school, we're starting to see kids just pull away from church, pull away from their faith. Now, It's a legitimate concern, and and it's a pretty personal concern for me being a student minister. Students are either dropping the baton while they're running after they've graduated, or something's going wrong with the exchange. Something's amiss with the handoff. And when that happens, there's a lot of blame that goes around, right? Unfortunately, we're really good about that. We're really good about uh, passing the blame. Right? Well, it's the youth group's fault. 
All I do is eat pizza and play games. Which, guilty. I love pizza. If you can run, I'll eat pizza, right? It's the parents' fault. They're failing in their responsibility to be the spiritual leaders to their kids. It's the older church's fault, the older generation. They're irrelevant and hypocritical to the point the younger generation wants nothing to do with it. And quite frankly, it's all a little frustrating. I mean, don't get me wrong, there's pr plenty of blame to go around. But I get this mental picture of a baton, right, just laying on the ground. Someone dropped the baton, it's laying on the ground. And there's this group of people, they're all standing around the baton. Mm. Did you drop this? Well, I didn't drop it. Hey, who dropped this? We need to figure out who dropped this. I'm going to form a committee that's going to find out who dropped this, right? Uh, it's crazy. What would it look like if instead of standing around the baton, instead of standing around the problem and looking at it and trying to figure out whose fault is it, what if we started just walking to it and picked it up and started running with it? Far too often in, in these students' lives, they see a whole bunch of people identifying the problem. Yep, there it is. Unfortunately, they're not seeing a whole lot of, let's pick this back up. Let's continue the race. With the rules from the rule book, the key to this rule is responsibility. If you've been running the race and, and you drop the baton, you're the one that has to pick it back up. What would it look like if we started raising a generation of students who, who stopped focusing so much on themselves and started focusing on the kingdom? I, I, I kind of have a passion for, and I don't want you to mis, mishear me, I kind of have a passion for um, destroying dreams. <laughs> and here's what I mean by that. I think that we, we're kind of guilty of raising a generation of students who are incredibly selfish. We've gotten away from, from pointing students to the kingdom of God and pointing them towards a holy and righteous and perfect loving father, and we started pointing to them. We said, you can achieve your dreams, right? All the, the Garfield cat posters, right? Shoot for the moon, even if you miss, you'll land among the... You know them, see? And, 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 and don't, don't confuse what I'm saying. I think it's great to be... I think it's great to shoot for these, but the problem is that we've created a whole generation of students whose whole world is them. Do you see how that's a problem? And again, it's not a blame game. It's just, just what would it look like if we started raising our kids and our students in this generation to be kingdom workers, to be kingdom-minded, that let's remove them from the equation and say, what can you do for the kingdom? Not what it can do for you. So I know that today is supposed to be about seniors, but I think there may be some truths for the rest of us as well. To those of you who are in the room today who have fumbled the baton as you tried to pass it on, I said, you have the gospel, and you're, you've been running with it, and, and it came time to pass it on to someone else. Maybe you fumbled for whatever reason. Maybe you fumbled it because you've been living hypocritically. You show up to church on Sunday, and, and everything looks good. But then if we, we look at you throughout the week, wait a minute. Something doesn't add up there. Maybe you've fumbled your past just through neglect, yeah, I got this gospel, but I don't need to give it to anyone else. Whatever the case, pick it back up. Pick it back up and start running. 
to those in the room who have received the baton, but you dropped it. Someone invested in you. They gave it. They, they made the exchange, but you dropped it. Maybe you've turned your back on God. Maybe you were caught up with your own selfish desires. Maybe it's been a slow drop through apathy and distraction. Whatever the case, pick it back up and run the race. And to the one who's carrying the baton into the takeover lane, the parent with the teenager, to the teacher, the coach, the small group leader, the boss, the children's volunteer, really whoever has a Timothy in their life, to the one who's been walking with Jesus for years, but you've never even considered what it means to invest into someone else's life. It's who and it's how time. Who are you going to invest into? Who are you going to pass it on to? And how are you going to do it? This morning is a special morning because we get to uh, recognize some graduates. So now's the time you guys can come on up. They're going to join me on stage here. Um, And uh, here's a little interactive thing I like to do. Um, How many of you have ever been to a a football game or maybe like a Thunder game or something like that? Um, so, So if your team scores, you cheer really loud, right? Because um, it was an accomplishment. They scored a goal basket unit thing, right? That's cool. I'm happy for them. Uh, these guys have achieved a milestone, right? They have graduated high school almost, yes. Yeah, you have, and still, there's still time. <laughs> no, uh, it, it's, it's coming. It's here, right? All the hard work, all the, all the papers, all the projects, it's, it's complete. They've achieved a milestone. So, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to introduce, I'm going to say their first name one at a time. And, and after I say their name, I just want you to cheer like they just won the Super Bowl or beat the Warriors or whatever. Uh, it, it, I just want you to go crazy for these guys because they've done the work and they deserve it. So the first one that we want to recognize is Gavin Michael Lack. <laughs> Yeah, that was good. That was pretty good. Gavin is, uh, his parents are Cody and Alyssa Lack. Uh, He's graduating from Enid High School and he's graduating with honors, which is awesome. Uh, Yeah, great, great. Gavin plans to attend East Central University where he will be running cross country and track. Pretty fitting. That do all right? Do you do the relay? One of them? So you know. <laughs> Should have had you preach this sermon. It's awesome. He'll be running cross country track and he plans to major in physical theory, therapy and or fairy. I don't even know what that is. I'm educated. Uh, he, he plans to major in physical therapy and or business. He's attended Oakwood for about four years and his favorite verse is Hebrews 12. Two, looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who, for the joy that was set before him, endured the cross, despising its shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. Our next graduate is Caleb Benton Meadows. You guys have been to a sporting event before. This is good. Caleb's the son of Jeff Meadows and Diana Crawford. He's graduating from Ch- or graduated from Chisholm High School. Congratulations. Caleb was active in sports programs at Chisholm. 
and from what I hear, pretty studly. Uh, he plans to go to OSU, OKC, go Pokes, I'm not biased. Uh, and then he, he wants to join the Navy. Uh, Caleb has attended about 14 years at Oakwood, and his favorite verse is John 15, 13. And I think this is really cool. Greater love has no one than this, than to lay down his life for his friends. Um, and so today, um, a little bit figuratively, I, I want to pass the baton to you guys. Um, you, you've heard the gospel. You've heard the message. And now it's your turn. It's your turn to run the race. And there's going to be times where you drop the baton. There's going to be times where um, it doesn't make sense. But the reality is that there's a God in heaven who loves you beyond your wildest imagination. And he wants nothing more than to have a relationship with you. Seriously. I'm not making it up. That's the truth. So what I want to do, is, as Paul often talks about, is, is I just want to lay hands on you guys and I want to pray over you. And then you guys can, you know, not stand on stage anymore. It should be good for you, right? But uh, let, me, let me just pray for you guys and then and we'll send you off and then we're going to uh, have a time to respond together as a church. So would you pray with me?